Hello everyone. We're now going to start dealing with discontinuous functions and periodic functions. Um, basically with discontinuity we mean piecewise because that's a, obviously a prereq for the Laplace transform. And really the goal for right now is to write piecewise functions in a way that we can take the Laplace transform of them. Because as written with the bracket, uh, you know, there's really nothing that we know how to do except to use the um, the integral, which again, recommend that you don't do anymore. And so we want to take the Laplace transform of them and then so when by using that knowledge we can use that to solve any IVP that we want, right? So cool. Up first is the unit step function. So unit step which um, can be written here as u t and then also u subscript 0 of t basically means that up until t equals 0 it's 0 and then right at t equals 0 and forever it is turned on and it is equal to 1. So to see this graphically it looks something like this so it's all the way over here and then open right here close that's not a straight line, sorry about that. Yeah, I'm not the great art the greatest artist, so that's good enough, okay. And then that's equal to one. And so the point of this is that when you multiply a function with something like this, you're basically turning it on at zero and letting it go on forever. Now, for Laplace, you do that anyways, right? Because the integral only sees from 0 to infinity. So you have been technically multiplying by u0 of t all this time. So what's the next logical step? Let's look at the shifted version. Why is that moving with it? Ah, okay, cool. u of t minus c, which is how classes beyond this typically write it, and then for the textbook in here it, it usually says u subscript c of t, and it's pretty much the same thing except now instead of t equals zero it's any arbitrary number that you want uh, c where it gets turned on so basically what it looks like now is there's a special point c that up until then it's just zero right uh, it's zero right here open circle and then and then it's an open at c right and then here it gets turned on and it goes on forever and ever okay but so piecewise functions don't go on forever right well I mean they can but you want to indicate certain intervals where they're available right so we have f of t that's only available for, between values of t between 2 and 5 so how do we select intervals in which you can turn functions on and off because that's really the whole purpose of this and so I, uh, I'll i show you how to kind of come up with this on your own. Um, that's a good exercise to kind of prove to yourself why all this happens. So let's say we have something, and we're going to call it u a of t. Okay. So what that means is that at a, it turns on. And before that, it's just 0, right? Then I'm going to propose that a is less than b, and I'm going to write negative u b of t. Okay, so that just means flip across the x-axis, right? So now what happens is I said b is greater than a, so there's b right here, and then it's going to be at minus one, and then it goes on forever and ever like that. But it's still zero up until then, right? Okay, cool. Now, what if you add these two together? What would you get? The following is what you would get. You would get this function would now be called u a of t minus u b of t. And what it would look like is between a and b, right? Because up until a, it's all zero. Because both a is less than b and it's all zero between the two of them. Between a and b, it's one, right? Because, and this doesn't matter too much, the fact that this one's a hole and the other one's open. Uh, in terms of the integral, it doesn't, it doesn't matter too much. And so that's one, by the way, that's one as well. And then once you hit b, it's now one plus minus one, 
right? And so at this point, it closes and it stops at zero. Therefore, you're now indicating that the function be turned on at A and turned off at B. And this is what's called an indicator function. You just indicate where to turn it on and where to turn it off. And you just simply multiply your function f of t by uh, this magic formula right here, which is exactly what's up there to indicate where you want to define your piecewise function. So that's pretty cool, honestly, because now, now that you're a little bit more mathematically mature, you can now rewrite this in a single line, which is what the purpose of it is. You know that 3t squared plus 7 is only turned on between 3 and 4. So this is as easy as 3t squared plus 7, because everywhere else it's 0, right? It's 0 before 3 and it's 0 after 4. And you want to indicate between 3 and 4. So that is as easy as 3 u3t minus u4t. And that's it. One line. You no longer need to use the um, curly brace notation. Now, we need to apply this Laplace, right? So what is the Laplace of this unit step? It's given as follows. Um, we can go through it. I think, yeah, that's a good idea. So, again, the integral Laplace transform is defined as 0 to infinity, e to the minus st, and then our function is uc of t, dt. What this means, really, is that this thing now only gets turned on at c to infinity, and it's still e to the minus st, dt. Right. And so, taking antiderivative of this, this is minus 1 over s e to the minus st from infinity to c, which is the same as 0 plus 1 over s e to the minus sc. And so, therefore, you get the same thing, e to the minus sc over s for s greater than 0. And that would be your Laplace transform. So, cool. All right, so how are we going to start taking Laplace of these, uh, of something attached with a unit step function? And it goes like this. You basically have uc of t inside, but you also have to have f of t minus c. So what this means is a shift by c units in time in your function f of t multiplied by unit step that's shifted by the same value, so by the same unit c equates to a multiplication of an exponential in the s domain, which means that at that point, all you have to really do is take the Laplace of the f of t unshifted and just tack on e to the minus c s. And again, because of the one-to-one -one correspondence, you can do the same thing for the inverse. Um, this one, for some reason, is my I've seen a lot of students kind of fail to grasp, and which is perfectly fine. And so I want, I want to just stress right now that uh, you have to make sure that the function has that same shift in C. And if it doesn't, don't worry, you can rearrange it so that it does. And I'll show you in the next example. This example I actually do every semester because I think it's very, it's easy enough to digest just by looking at, but it tests that concept that is just so critical that, um, you know, that's why I do it every time. And so by looking at this, right, you can rewrite this in one line. It's very similar to what we just did. So this is just quantity t minus pi. And you turn it on at pi, so u pi of t minus u 2 pi of t. OK, cool. But we want to take Laplace. So let's deal with this each on their own. right? So we have t minus pi u pi of t, right? And then we have a minus sign, which I'll, I'll take care of at the end, as always. And then it's t minus pi u2 pi of t. Now, as, that, uh, as taking Laplace of this goes, this one right here is in the form that we can just directly take Laplace of. What this means is, okay, we have the function t, and it's shifted by pi, which is exactly the shift that we have here. So what happens is we tack on an e to the minus cs, where c is pi in this case, and then we take the Laplace of t itself. And that comes out to be e to the minus pi s over s squared, 
right? Because the loss of t is just 1 over s squared. So that's fine. We've solved this part. This one on the right hand side is not as easy, right? Because what needs to happen is we want a shift of 2 pi, but we don't have it. So what do we need to do? Well, we can write t quantity t minus 2 pi plus pi, right? That's the same thing. We haven't done anything except we've written it in slightly different notation. And now here we can rewrite this as t minus 2 pi and then it's u2 pi of t plus pi u2 pi of t. Now this is the same case. We, we take e to the minus 2 pi s Laplace of t and then this one is a plus so quantity because we still have this minus sign over here that I'm not going to forget about plus quantity uh, the same thing it has e to the minus 2 pi s and then we want to take a little plus of pi it's a very bad pi yeah okay and so what this means is that Laplace of t we've already done so um, let me put this right here from the first part that we had was e to the minus pi s over s squared minus quantity e minus 2 pi s times Laplace of t which is just going to be 1 over s squared again so e to the minus 2 pi s over s squared and then it's going to be a plus e to the minus 2 pi s and then Laplace of pi is just gonna, you can bring out the pi in front, right, because it's linear. And then Laplace of one is just s on the bottom. And so that's the key distinction here. You have to make sure that the shift exists and that it's exactly the same as the unit step. So just keep that in mind. Okay, cool. Uh, so that right there says periodic functions. And so now let's deal with periodic functions. So, a function with period t is periodic, or functions with period t are periodic, if any time, any t value, any time point in time that you add that period t has to equal what that function is equal to at that original time, which is, which is this. For all t inside, uh, in the real domain, right? Um, so examples of periodic a sine, cosine, uh, tangent, cotangent, the uh, trigonometric ones are just inherently periodic and so you need to make sure that you have this before you tackle it. And so how you do this goes as follows. So for Laplace, if f of t is piecewise continuous from 0 to infinity, which you should have anyways, and is of a exponential order, again, prerequisite, and periodic with period capital T, then the Laplace of that periodic function is 1 over 1 minus e to the minus s capital T, so the period, integral from 0 to capital T, e to the minus st, f of t, dt. So this one just simply comes down to, to the formula. And um, most professors actually don't cover this. So if your professor isn't covering it, feel free to, you know, this is the end of the video for you. But again, knowledge is power so there's no reason why not to learn this in my opinion but anyway let's get started on this one let's see if I can keep the formula up there at least for a little while we have f of t it's between 0 and 1 and it has a period of t is equal to 1 okay so let's deal with the integral part first of the formula we need to go from 0 to the period e to the minus st f of t dt so to me, that seems like it's from 0 to 1, right? Period is 1. e to the minus st. And then your f of t is just t, dt. Cool. So you obviously have to do by parts. Um, let's make our u equal to t. Our du is equal to dt. And then our dv would equal e to the minus st uh, dt, right? And then our v is equal to 
minus 1 over s e to the minus st. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah, sorry, the formula is not going to be able to stay up, I think. I write too big. Okay. Um, at this point, again, it's uv minus v du, which you've done before, so that's good. So it becomes minus t over s e to the minus st minus integral of v du, so it's going to be a plus 1 over s e to the minus st dt. Again, the 1 over s can come outside, and so when you take the antiderivative of this, the this minus t over s contribution stays the same because there's no integral on it. And then this part becomes minus 1 over s squared e to the minus st. And then you evaluate this whole thing from 0 to 1. Right? Cool. Um, what happens now is you just plug in 0 and 1. And so you end up getting, when you evaluate at 1, right? And remember, this is that you evaluate t, not s. So it's minus 1 over s. Um, e to the minus s, right? Minus 1 over s squared e to the minus s. Good. And then you do minus. Evaluating at 0, that's going to be 0 for the first one. And then over here, it's going to give you a minus 1 over s squared. Good. Which then means that we, if you simplify this a little bit further, I kind of got shifted a little bit, okay. Simplifying this further, this turns out to be 1 over s squared minus 1 over s e to the minus s minus 1 over s squared e to the minus s. Cool, cool. And so, therefore, your Laplace of this periodic function is equal to, you have to have that contribution 1 over 1 minus e to the minus s times the period. And the period was 1 in this case, so it's just 1 minus e to the minus s. And then you just multiply it by everything that we just calculated up here. I meant that to be a minus sign, but I guess it didn't come out that way. And there you go. So for this one, you do have to take the integral, and you just have to be careful of what you're taking the integral of, and that's it. That's all you really have to follow. Great. So now, I mean, obviously, next step, next video is to now take, now solve IVPs with functions that are discontinuous or periodic. And, yeah. So, I'll see you then.